Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session where we'll be talking about developer-first APIs and why we believe that this is the new norm, or rather, the existing norm of API management. I'm Himarsha Guruge, a technical lead at WSO2. So I'm going to start with something familiar, uh, hopefully for some of you in the audience. Any fans out there? OK. So this is Pokemon Go. It's an augmented reality mobile game that was developed by Niantic. And it was first released uh, in 2016 for a certain set of countries. And the rest of the regions followed uh, over the next couple of months or so. So they had a staggered release uh, for this game. So the basic idea behind this game is that it uses your uh, GPS of your mobile, uh, mobile device uh, to uh, track and capture these virtual creatures who are called Pokemons. Um, and they would appear as if they're in the player's vicinity. So this was really successful because they already have this established fan base even before this game came out. Um, and they had this highest revenue of any mobile game ever in its first month. So why am I talking about this today? Um, so, uh, so, so their initial release was only done for a set of countries, right? The initial first set of releases. And uh, the game enthusiasts, or rather the players, wanted to figure out how this GPS tracking works, how this uh, backend service really work, and how accurate this functionality is, because the basic concept was based on the geolocation and how you retrieve that data. But um, Niantic did not have a public API exposed at this time, and so they couldn't really find much of information about this. So what they did was go ahead and try to find things on their own. So uh, a set of players, or rather hackers, uh, they placed a man in the middle attack, uh, and they were able to reverse engineer the API. So what a man in the middle attack does is it uh, allows the hacker to intercept the communication between the client and the server. So by intercepting, you can uh, see the data that is going through. And through reverse engineering, you can transform or manipulate that raw data into a useful form that you can use. So in this case, what they did was GPS spoofing. So that is basically you feed the server with false geolocation data and trick the server to believe that you are in a different location than your real physical location. So with this, um, even if you were in a country where the game was not already released, you were able to send this uh, false geolocation data and trick the server to believe that you are in some place else and the Pokemons would appear for you to capture them. So um, along with this reverse engineering of the API, they were able to build these uh, unofficial third-party applications as well, which uh, manipulate with some of the rest of the other features of the game as well. So uh, they had this uh, concept where some of the Pokemons were region locked. So in order to catch certain type of Pokemons, you have to be within that region. So with this uh, GPS spoofing and a lot of third-party applications coming into place, they were able to uh, manipulate these functionalities. OK. Right. So uh, now imagine, because the first set of releases were to cater only a certain set of load, so they had, a fo they had forecasted a certain set of load, and the servers were set up to cater that load. But now with this GPS spoof spoofing, players around the world were able to send requests to the servers, and the server overload was a very common issue back then. And this screen was very familiar uh, for most of the players and in inter interrupted their game flow. So um, with regards to the uh, man in the middle attack, Niantic got back with this uh, certificate uh, pinning. It's a sec security mechanism where the client is pre-configured to uh, know the server certificate that it should expect. So uh, they, they came back with certificate pinning, uh, adding that uh, security layer. But so much of information was extracted at the initial reverse engineering of the API uh, these players were able to uh, break that patch. So Niantic got back with a second patch on top of that, and it just took them four days to break that second patch as well. So the main reason for that is 
um, along with all these events happening, there was this self-formed, this independently formed uh, gamers community um, who unfortunately had some programming folks as well. So uh, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, there's this Reddit thread that you can even go today and have a look at it. And um, it, it provides all these updates saying that um, th these, uh, these are the information that we figured out, and uh, these are the uh, solutions we are going to try and break this, uh, break this patch. And uh, there are people coming up and saying, listen, hey, I have this skill set. I can help you out with this. So uh, with all this information and expertise put in together, they were able to break the second patch as well. So the next set of patch Niantic got back came with a legal uh, warning as well. So this, was, uh, this went out for some of the players in the community saying, listen, we have uh, detected that you are using these unauthorized third-party applications, and we obviously recommend you to not uh, continue with this. And if you continue with it, we will have to suspend your account. And they really did suspend some of the accounts in the community. So if you really think about this situation, right, the, the people who hacked and uh, you know, created this whole dilemma, they were not really bad guys. They were just really keen and uh, really enthusiastic about the game. And uh, unfortunately, they knew programming as well. So um, you know, if there was a way where uh, these uh, uh, players could get information in a more uh, secure manner or where uh, it, it was more open, uh, at least some of the information. Uh, these third-party applications could have been built in a legitimate manner, and this could have been another revenue stream. So let's take a minute and try to look at the uh, typical API ecosystem. So we have been talking about APIs for the past two days. So um, APIs in its simplest form is this contract that you have, which does the heavy lifting so that software can communicate with each other. And it also allows you to expose your data uh, in a uniform manner and for your consumers to access that data. And we, on one side, we have the uh, API developers who create and publish the APIs, who we can call as the API publishers. And if you think about the consumers, um, of course, we have the end users uh, most of the time who will be using an application which consumes the API. but the immediate API consumer, the direct API consumer that consumes the API are the application developers. So they would uh, call the API, create some useful application on top of it, and the end users can use that third party application. So with this, it highlights that there's this developer ecosystem around an API where developers create APIs for another set of developers. So uh, if you take some pointers from a Pokemon Go case, right? Um, the server load issues and uh, the whole security related issues, these are underlying issues, issues to your uh, design or your architecture, scalability, availability, and of course the API security mechanisms that you use. And on the other hand, uh, the app developers. So uh, the main reason why the, the whole series of events took place is because they had lack of information and also about this developer community that was self-formed, uh, the level of expertise and knowledge they had could have been converted into an opportunity rather than a threat. So this suggests that if you have an APS strategy today, or if you are thinking of forming an APS strategy, it really needs to uh, enable and cater both these parties in an equal manner. So let's go ahead and see uh, some of the typical uh, API strategies you can use for both these user groups. So let's first consider the API providers who create uh, or publish these APIs. So if you decide to open up your APIs, uh, open them in, uh, in a standard manner, like an open API uh, specification. Uh, so use a standard manner to open up your APIs. And even if you open up your APIs, or even if you don't, but you have an API, the first thing is you have to secure that as much as possible. So you need to have proper authentication. Maybe it's mutual SSL, basic authentication, or you work with or tokens. Regardless of the way that you do it, you need to have proper authentication for your API. 
And then, of course, um, if you're exposing your API out, you need to make sure that it is only accessible by the intended party. And this is all about authorizing, authorization. So there can be, you can authorize uh, based on role, user roles, or based on different attributes. Once again, uh, authentication and authorization are key uh, security mechanisms that you need to think about. And uh, you need to have a proper API version management. If you are working on new features or you're deprecating something, regardless of that, you need to maintain versions of your APIs as well. And this leads to the whole uh, governing of your APIs with an API lifecycle. So, so you know, we have a typical uh, a common lifecycle for an API where you first create the API, you publish them, and later on, uh, you might deprecate that API. So these different states need to be managed uh, in a proper manner. If you are, uh, uh, let's assume that you are trying to uh, deprecate a specific API version, right? But you can't just do it abruptly because there might be a subscriber who is using that specific, that specific version and has created an application that is already in production. So you need to do you need to have proper graceful deprecation if you're deprecating that version. And similarly, introducing new features should come uh, with new um, API versions so that your uh, new subscribers can access that. And of course, uh, plan for the unexpected. You might have a forecast uh, load right now, but you need to make sure that you always have this uh, security layer or you shield your backend servers so that they're not overload, right? This, this comes with the uh, typical rate limit, API rate limiting and quotas that we specify and backend thresholds that you can uh, configure, but you need to have this uh, even though you might not be expecting much traffic. When you design your uh, system or your, when you are doing a deployment, uh, it may be a small one or a big one, but from day one, try to have the right deployment or the right design in place so that when later on, when you have to scale, you can scale it easily and you do not have to do a lot of architectural changes to scale. So if you are in a monolithic architecture, make sure that the API management solution or the deployment that you are doing is able to scale vertically and horizontally. And if it's a microservices architecture that you're going to use or you're hoping to use, make sure that your API management deployment is also able to cater to those deployment patterns that exist in a microservices architecture. And um, don't try to deviate API management from your typical developer workflow. Right? Uh, try to treat it as another, uh, try to fit it into the development workflow where your developers can work parallelly. So we have this uh, where, where, where a development team might be working on a set of APIs or a single APIs. So try to align that process with it. And of course, time to market is key to any organization out there. And that means you have to automate a lot of your processes. So also try to fit in the API management part, how you deploy your APIs, how you develop them, how it's going to move through your different environments, Plan all that out, that out and also include your CI, CD processes to it. So um, also related to the DevOps, so if, if, uh, if you have a cloud native architecture and you are hoping to have Docker or Kubernetes deployments, make sure that your API management solution comes with support to that as well. You might have to uh, connect to uh, service registries or if you have a microservices architecture, you might have to work with a service mesh in the future. So is your API management solution aligned with that? You need to combine your API and your DevOps excellence as well along with it. And of course, provide the right tool set for your uh, engineers. If they like to work with CLIs, uh, try to give that opportunity to them. If they like to work with UIs, cater to that. So have different tool sets uh, Try to provide those uh, tool sets through the API management solution that you choose so that they don't have to deviate from the usual process that, or the tools that they work with. And of course, if anyone is trying to improve, you need to gain some insight. You need to create that feedback loop so that you can look at, the, look at that feedback and improve your system. 
So uh, you might uh, need, uh, need to understand how your API usage is like. Right? And if a certain API has a high fa uh, fault uh, uh, invocation, you need to troubleshoot and understand what's wrong. Is it because of bad documentation, or uh, is it because you know some, uh, some, something's really wrong with my API? So the only way you can um, get those information is through creating this feedback loop, through, uh, through analytics, through statistics, uh, metrics, and tracing, and so on. So always have uh, those data. Always have a way to enable those data to help you out and improve your system. And when we think about the API consumers, or mainly the application developers in this case, make your API as informative as possible. This is about providing proper API documentation. Maybe it's Swagger documentation, or maybe you, try, you want to include a how-to guide so that uh, the application developers who are trying to consume your API can go through it and understand what this API does and what information he or she needs to invoke this API. Also, um, regardless of the tool set or the technology the application developer must be using, try to cater to most of these components. So uh, this comes with the concept of providing SDKs or software development toolkits uh, in different technologies so that they can just simply download the relevant uh, SDK and uh, work with your API, basically invoke your API. And have a proper uh, onboarding mechanism or self-registering mechanism for your consumers. So, uh, and, and also, if internally you need to uh, have some sort of a workflow process where these registrations should be manually approved, uh, try to cater all of that and make it as convenient as possible for your subscribers. If you are publishing APIs and you are providing them uh, to your subscribers to access, they should also, you should also provide a way where they can easily test, test out those APIs. So this comes out with the concept of providing these consoles uh, where they can you know, just create a test token or uh, whatever the security may be basic call. So create those uh, information in a very small time and you can just test it out and uh, make sure that you, know, you, you are invoking this API or you're calling this resource in the correct manner. And of course, um, this should have been uh, this should have been a more priority case. If you are publishing your APIs, you need to have a proper developer portal where you provide the catalog of the APIs that you published, so that your subscribers can discover and you know uh, consume these APIs. So you can start off with a simple developer portal where you, uh, these uh, APIs are published, and they can search through tags and so on. And this can be built to the level of an API marketplace. So API marketplace is a bit more than a simple uh, uh, developer portal, where it provides this complete uh, user experience, and it promotes API reuse, and uh, it enhances the API adoption. So how this is done is, on top of the basic developer portal that you have, you need to uh, have workshops, um, then work on incentives, they can be, uh, um, uh, it can be financial where you have monetization in place or non-financial um, incentives such as you create a leaderboard with uh, the top subscribers or top APIs, et cetera. And of course, um, evangelize and uh, have hackathons and workshops and basically build that community uh, so that they can really cater to it. So uh, don't hesitate to you know, take a moment, uh, analyze your API strategy that you have, and uh, make sure that uh, it, it caters or it is aligned with where you want to go, um, and also make sure that your API management solution that you have is uh, ready to support your developers or ready to support that ecosystem around an API so that you can reach API success. Thank you very much.